Today, once more, they will replenish themselves, cheat death again, through the power of their source. Matt Stone, 180DegreeHealth.com Hey, this is Matt Stone from 180 Degree Health, and I decided not to do something in front of the camera today and just do it on the microphone because I plan on going for a little... A little while today, maybe, I don't know, I'm thinking 20 to 30 minutes. I don't really know how uh, how nerded out I'm going to get it. But uh, the, the inspiration for doing this is I was supposed to be interviewed by someone about childhood obesity. And that interview fell through, and as soon as I knew that it was a possibility that I might be doing this interview, I got really excited and I started thinking about all these different things that I could talk about, and then all of a sudden... Uh, when the interview got canceled, I sort of got left with severe mental constipation. So anyways, I'm having a mental bowel movement on childhood obesity, and uh, because I'm sort of silly, I think I'm going to actually interview myself. And the person who's going to interview me was a woman, so uh, I'm going to use my best uh, womanly uh, interviewee, interviewer voice and see you know, if I can put together a good interview here to take the place on the one that was snatched away from me that I'm so upset about. So, Matt, I noticed that a lot of kids at schools are fat, and the teachers are fat, and the lunch ladies are fat. Do you think that the school lunches are contributing to all this fatness? Well, I appreciate your question, Matilda, um, because I really wanted to actually talk about this topic. Um, recently, we've had a lot of interventions about with government school lunch, and the whole idea was that uh, you know we're going to restrict calories. That was one big part of it. Uh, we're going to cut some fats back and we'll switch over from drinking whole milk and make that banned. Switch over to some 1% milk instead, or skim, or whatever they have, uh, low-fat milk instead of this uh, obviously obesity-causing <laughs> whole milk. And other interventions and, and things like that. There's a long list of different interventions that they had. But obviously, uh, you know, people look at school lunch as being sort of the epitome of disgusting, horrible, low-quality garbage. And in many cases, it is very industrialized crap. A lot of nuggets and fries and frozen foods and packaged stuff. And not a whole lot of fresh food. And uh, definitely a lot of stuff that the kids, you know, they like to eat. Because kids, you know, generally speaking, they like to eat sort of cracked out foods. And once they've tasted uh, the good stuff, it's hard for them to really get interested in eating things that aren't chicken nuggets and macaroni and cheese and things that are very fatty, salty, uh, you know, full of refined carbohydrates and very calorie dense and flavorful uh, with a lot of flavor enhancers and things like that as well to sort of trick them into thinking that uh, it's superior to all those just plain boring natural foods. It's hard to get a kid sometimes to eat a sweet potato once they've had uh, pepperoni pizza and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's definitely school lunch is definitely a contributing factor, but it's, you know, they're just serving uh, the kind of foods that kids are probably eating a lot of anyways, and, and, you know, their parents are feeding them, they're used to going out to restaurants and eating those foods, and so forth. But I have a little bit of a pet peeve with this whole idea that we can now intervene, and that the interventions should come in the form of, uh, you know, cutting fats out of the diet and things like that. I think that's, you know, getting rid of whole milk, one of the most nutritious foods in the cafeteria is uh, pretty crazy, uh, knowing that there's going to be more uh, you know, chicken nuggets in its place and things like that. So the reason I have such a pet peeve with it is because we know a lot of things, a lot of the propensity to develop uh, obesity in childhood and in later years is established long before a kid becomes uh, you know, an eight-year-old in second grade. Um, you know, we have... Uh, all these different factors that take place, and uh, Robert Lustig actually has one of the best quotes, uh, which is, you know, we are having an epidemic of, uh, obesity epidemic of six-month-old babies. Um, so, we know that we're having a lot of these factors that, uh, you know, make someone more prone to be, de you know, develop obesity in the modern environment, which includes diet and lifestyle, of course. And these factors are established early on. So uh, we can talk about some of those in, in the interview, but these, uh, these factors are definitely uh, something that just aren't on people's normal radar screen, and they don't realize that childhood obesity is a problem that, that starts, its genesis is long before a kid you know, eats his, his, first, uh, his or her first happy meal. Well, thank you, Matt. A very interesting response. Uh, you know, I, what, are, what are some of these very specific 
hormonal things that you're talking about or hereditary factors. I mean, if childhood obesity, you, you're saying that it's developed, you know, between the ages of zero and two, or, or you know, the kids are developing these problems or early warning signs at, uh, you know, as infants. Uh, tell us about some of those. Well, thank you again, Matilda. I mean, I'm, you know, uh, I would love to talk about those uh, different factors. It's, it's, you're almost psychic. How did you know I wanted to talk about those things? Um, one of the things we, we know is a huge factor in a person's, uh, you know, propensity towards developing obesity later in life or in childhood is the number of fat cells that they have and also the size of those fat cells. Um, the, the more fat cells you have and the larger your fat cells, the, the greater your chances are of becoming obese and the more rapid you usually, uh, or the more difficulty you have losing weight and the faster you regain that, that weight, uh, depending on those factors. And those things are set up before, uh, long before we eat our first happy meal, like I said. Um, so, you know, even just during breastfeeding or even, uh, you know, I bet, I bet we could actually establish this, this kind of thing, uh, you know, as soon as a kid comes, comes out, um, before it's even had any breast milk or formula, which is another huge factor, and, uh, you know, I'll definitely talk about that one. Um, we know that if a kid is breastfed, chances of obesity, far, far less. And we also know that if a child, the longer a child is breastfed, um, the better. So six months better than zero, 12 months better than six, 24 months seems to be almost a foolproof uh, obesity prevention. So, I, you know, obviously one of the things that people listening to this are going to want to know is, how do, how do I, if I have an obese child, what do I do to keep it from getting worse? Also, if I have a child or I'm thinking about having a child, what can I do to prevent childhood obesity? I mean, ultimately, hopefully we can get into a little conversation about, you know, what seems to me to be the best uh, strategy to, to, you know, go with. But uh, those are just a couple of the major ones. Um, there's several others. I mean, basically, we have the intrauterine environment. So when we're in the womb, we're exposed to a lot of hormonal things. If our mother, for example, is dieting, and particularly in the third trimester, I believe it is, our chances for developing childhood obesity, obesity later in life, type 2 diabetes, heart disease, and basically metabolic syndrome, uh, that our chances are exponentially greater if our mother is dieting during that period. So we know that it's not just a genetic thing. We know that things that take place uh, potentially even prior to conception. And we also know of epigenetic factors, which things that took place, you know, took place maybe 70 years ago are uh, actually impacting our genes and what is switched on and switched off. So we have so many things that have occurred before we're even born that impact obesity and our propensity to to you know get fat in our modern eating environment and uh, you know so it's certainly not just a matter of what you eat because you can take a hundred people you can put them all on the same diet some people will be tall some people will be short some people will be fat some people will be so skinny you wonder if uh, you know the breeze is gonna blow them away um, you know if you put all these different people in the same eating environment we get all different kinds of results coming out of that sort of uh, factory so there's all different kinds of things that impact it and most of it I would say 90 or 95 percent of our propensity to develop obesity is something that occurs during the first two years of life or before life even begins wow Matt that's really uh, interesting and also depressing I mean uh, you know for somebody out there who's got an obese eight-year-old that's uh, obviously a little bit too late to be having some of these interventions but you know what is wrong with some of these interventions can can't we just eat less and exercise more? I mean, surely that will have an impact, right? Well, you know, in theory, we think that it should have a huge impact. Um, you know, obviously, people, if they stop eating and they start exercising a lot, they lose some weight. And it seems to be, on the surface, to be a solution or a potential solution. We know from actually studying the subject that it's not a realistic solution. It's more of a pipe dream. And because people just, they, they can't stick to it. It's not realistic. You know, 98%, 99% of people... They're not going to be able to employ that strategy and have it actually work out in the long run. Uh, with dieting, restricting your calories, restricting your food intake, uh, the long-term result of that is that, uh, you know, for, for starters, you, with restricted or restrained eating, 
uh, that often leads to a lot of fattening eating behaviors, such as binge eating and dieting, binge eating and dieting. Uh, all these things sort of reinforce fat storage. Um, you know, obviously something that slows down your metabolism and increases your appetite, such as dieting or restricting calories. You know, you obviously wouldn't give a kid a pill that increases appetite and lowers metabolism if you're trying to give a kid a, a drug to, to solve obesity. So it's a pretty uh, naive notion that we can just restrict calories. This school lunch program obviously is ridiculous or, you know, throwing in a gym class or something like that because all these factors are set up long before, um, you know, we, we get to this point in life. I also think it's pretty unrealistic for people to think that they can actually live outside of what is socially normal. I mean, obviously, there's a small percentage who get off on living outside of what is socially normal. Uh, myself, I think I would probably include <laughs> that small percentage. But there's a, you know, the, most people are going to be normal. Normal means what most people do, and what most people do is they eat certain foods. You know, most people are raised on breakfast cereals and macaroni and cheese and, you know, Twizzlers and, um, what's that new stuff that's come out? Those morph, morph starbursts that change flavors in your mouth with their, uh, you know, flavor changing flavor beads or whatever they have in there. Um, a lot of really stimulating foods, a lot of, uh, you know, things that are classified as sort of junky foods. Uh, you know, we know that most people are going to be eating that type of way. Things are changing and things can change. I think we are becoming a lot more aware that our diet is really pretty atrocious, that we're not getting the nutrients that we need, that we are having some obesity problems from from our diet, and not just our diet, but other factors, and factors which I would love to speak about today. Um, but that's certainly, uh, it's unrealistic to think that you can eat a special diet for the rest of your life. A lot of people are trying, but I see a lot of people failing. They do it for a while, then they binge, and uh, you know, then they try another diet, and they go off the deep end. They just get sicker, and often get fatter and fatter as the process you know, unfolds. Eventually, they get to a point where they just want to eat everything and relax and stop being such a weirdo, restrict, restricting all kinds of things from the diet and entire macronutrient groups and things. And when they do actually go back to eating normal, quote-unquote normal, they find that a normal diet is even more fattening than it ever was before. So it's just it's not a long-term viable strategy. And, uh, you know, like I said, I just think it's naive to think that we can have these subtle interventions and that it's really going to work because we're really ignoring the truth. I mean, we're, we have to be in denial to think that eating less and exercising more or what I would consider to be intentional weight loss is a viable solution. It's just not. We know statistically speaking that it isn't a viable solution. So, I mean, we should really stop talking about it and start, you know, looking at other options, looking at alternatives that might actually work and looking at changing uh, the whole society in general, making, you know, broad sweeping changes in terms of uh, the type of fats we use or what is a normal American diet. Obviously, we can reinvent an American diet to be something else. Uh, it doesn't have to necessarily be uh, revolved around fast food. A hundred years ago, it, it didn't contain any fast food at all. So we can, we obviously have the power to change our diets around and change what is normal. And I think some of that change is underway. People are becoming a lot more conscious about where their food comes from. And, uh, you know, we're trying, but some of these efforts are just misguided because people don't understand. They don't understand that, uh, you know, imposing calorie limits and, and things like that on people is highly counterproductive and, um, you know, could actually end up backfiring uh, tremendously. We've talked a lot about food so far. And, um, you know, what are, what are some of the other factors that you think uh, people are ignoring? It sounds like, uh, you know, you don't think this is all about food. And, and certainly there's a lot of people out there thinking... You know, TV sure is uh, uh, fattening, and we're not getting any exercise and cutting out PE classes and things. I mean, how big of a factor is that? Well, I think it's a huge factor. And I think about this kind of thing a lot, especially recently. I'm kind of up in the mountains, and I see people uh, running around doing things and, and having a good time, and everybody's, you know, lean as can be. And, uh, you know, if you showed up in America and, and you know, showed up in the, the Colorado mountains, you wouldn't think that there was an obesity problem here at all with kids or adults. I mean, it just you just don't see it here. It's, it's almost like it doesn't exist. It's almost like it's its own island is, uh, separated from uh, the rest of society. And part of it is because there's just so much to do 
in you know, stimulating things to do outdoors. And you have skiing, you have hiking, you have mountain biking, you have all these different types of activities that people are engaged in. And that is socially normal here, to be doing those things with your time. You don't call your friends up and, uh, you know, hang out and play video games. If you grow up in an area like this, you're more likely to actually meet them on the ski hill and ski really hard for five hours, getting more cardio in than an average American gets in and you know, maybe four months in a single day. <laughs> so, um, you know, again, you know, I think about this a lot because, you know, if you keep a dog, if we look at, you know, canine obesity, if a dog doesn't have anything to do, it'll just lay around and kind of sleep and be a vegetable all day. And humans are the same way. I mean, if you don't have anything to do and you don't have any real purpose and there's nothing really meaningful in your life or you don't have any passions that you're pursuing, it's very easy to just let the TV take over and, and basically, uh, you know, babysit your mind, babysit your body, and just sort of waste away on the couch and to, you know, sort of drift away into another world and never do anything. I mean, if a kid is getting antsy because, you know, it's sitting, you know, he or she is sitting in the back seat and they're, uh, you know, in the car for four or five hours, they get really antsy because they're not moving their bodies around. They're dying to move around. But if you put an electronic device in front of them, uh, they will forget about that. Likewise, a, a kid would never just sit for three hours in one spot, but if you give them an electronic device or put a movie on or a couple movies in a row, they will sit motionless, just glued, watching it without moving a muscle. So these kind of a modern inventions are a huge factor in obesity because they keep us from doing the things that we would normally do. We would normally move around and do a lot of things and and send a lot of messages to our bodies that would encourage our bodies to be, um, you know, lean and sleek and athletic and able to, you know, climb mountains and lift things and run around and play and dance. I mean, if you don't provide that kind of stimulation to the body, the human body doesn't necessarily respond by, you know, looking like a an athlete if you're just sitting around on the couch. So anyway, I think that's a huge factor. We have a lot of things that interfere with our natural instincts to move around and do things and um, yeah I mean that we, we know statistically speaking as well that you know having a television in your bedroom for example <clears throat> is you know statistically correlated with obesity um, and there's a number of different reasons for that and I'd like to talk about that one as well sorry I'm kind of going off on a tangent here but um, you, you know TV number of hours of watching TV has a tight correlation with obesity and that makes sense I mean if you just sit around and do nothing all day, um, not only are you not, you know, giving your body any stimulation to, to look or work or function a certain way, but you're also, um, you know, you're so bored that food becomes the center of attention. I mean, it, it becomes the exciting part of your life. And there's a lot of foods out there that cause a lot of dopamine release. They cause a lot of neural excitation. And if you don't have anything else going on in your life, a lot of times you can become so fixated on food that it, it becomes addictive. Um, you know, I notice people, you know, and where I live out here, where I'm staying for the few months, they get their kicks in other ways. They get their kicks from other things besides food. Food isn't the center of attention. They can take it or leave it, and usually they forget to eat because they're just so engrossed in doing something that's enjoyable. <laughs> so anyway, that's a huge factor, I and mean, there's no question. Uh, specific, the TV in the bedroom thing, that's actually really, uh, really fascinating because I suspect that the reason that's such a big deal, specifically in the bedroom, is because when a TV is in your bedroom, you're likely to stay up later. You're also likely, and you probably get less sleep, but also sort of be out of sync with your hormonal rhythms and secretions and things that are done on a 24-hour cycle. We certainly know that people who work uh, the night shift, uh, they have a lot more health problems and obesity and things like that than people who work during the day. So there's a problem with staying up late at night. There's also a problem with looking into bright lights late at night. We have a lot of um, you know, photoreceptors in our skin and it causes us to secrete a lot more cortisol and things like that and prevent us from getting into that low cortisol state that prepares us for sleep. Um, so we have that factor. Uh, we also have the noise from television. We know that being subjected to a lot of noise um, and things like that increases cortisol levels. And 
imagine a kid, the likelihood that a kid would fall asleep with the TV on and the TV on being on all night, flashing their bodies with this, this uh, beams of light that, that actually triggers all kinds of different hormonal secretions. You have all this sound, which is triggering a lot more cortisol production and things. So you have all these things that could be going on there. And the reason I think that's interesting is because there's a huge connection between sleep and obesity. We know that if you don't get enough sleep, you can develop a pretty severe insulin resistance in about a week if you're sleep deprived enough. And our average night's sleep over the last century has gone from something like uh, nine hours a night to about seven. And people put all this, you know, emphasis on the food, but they, re they don't realize that it's not just food. It's not, we're not looking at a food issue that's causing obesity. We're looking at the whole thing. It's not just food, and it's not just TV, it's not, it's, and it's not just sleep. Uh, getting less sleep or the, being subjected to a lot of bright lights and advertising and all those kind of things. Everything is a factor. And if you look at it as, as one thing causing childhood obesity, then you're missing the whole point. You, it's really the entire diet, lifestyle, just way of life is fattening for a lot of people. And again whether a person becomes fat in response to this environment or does not depends largely on things that occur before uh, the child is even born or in the you know, first few years of development. So, um, you know, from a theoretical perspective, if you're thinking of having a child or you just had a child, you know, the best thing you can really do is, is um, you know, try to eat well, try to keep your metabolism high so that you keep this child from having those types of tendencies. You would want to do that. If, if dieting in the third trimester makes your kid fatter, then you would want to do the opposite of dieting. You would want to convince your body and get the body temperature way up high and get the body really resisting fat gain. And that's possible. Almost everybody can reach a ceiling in their fat gain um, where they're, they literally just can't gain any more fat no matter how hard they try. And in, in that state, your body is really, really defending hard against fat gain. You know, your metabolism is through the roof. You're, you're practically sweating all the time. And that would be the opposite of dieting. So anyway, I don't have a definitive thing to say about what a person should do for prevention. But that's certainly a good place to start. would be getting more sleep and de-stressing in any way you can. And doing the same things that you would do to stimulate a person's metabolism as an adult which would be eat more, relax, um, yeah, get some exercise, it's fine, but don't intentionally burn a bunch of excess calories. You actually want to be in a calorie surplus, you know, when you're trying to raise your metabolism or increase your metabolic rate. So you'd want to be in those things when you're, you know, before you conceive, also during pregnancy, uh, all those kind of things. And uh, that, that should make a huge impact. That should actually make a huge impact on how the hormonal environment and how you know susceptible a, a child is to developing obesity and before i go any further with that kind of thinking uh you know i just want to say that i don't have it there are no definitive answers about what we can do all we can do is really look at all the data together and all and i can take all my experience into account all the things that i've studied into account all my communications with other people into account and try to come up with what I think is to be the most likely big factors involved and in what we can do. If anybody does say something definitively, do this, don't do that, and this will fix the problem, they're, they're, <laughs> they're deluding themselves. I mean, they're really delusional, and they're looking at it overly simplistically, and they haven't looked at all the, the subtle complexities to this issue. So I'm not trying to provide a prescription or say that I know the answer. I'm just trying to provide my best answer with the knowledge and experience that I've accumulated over the years. So that's all I'm really trying to do with this interview. Okay, Matt. Well, uh, that's that's great and all, but uh, you know that's what we can do for prevention. But you make it sound pretty dismal. Like if you already have obesity, you're pretty much screwed. I mean, if you're a seven-year-old and you're obese, you know, forget about it. You might as well uh, just start pursuing comedy and see if you can sort of recreate. You know, Chris Farley or something like that. Uh, is there anything that a parent can actually do to you know, reduce a child's obesity successfully? Well, I think the greatest danger here is is overparenting, and 
just intervening too much. We know that when parents intervene and control a child's eating, a child becomes more prone to developing obesity. Uh, restrain and restricted eating. Cut things out of a kid's diet, forbid them from eating certain things. That increases a child's uh, chances of becoming obese. I think the best thing that you can do is just create a very neutral eating environment where eating is not this ooh, ah, oh, that's so good, oh, I look what I got, I got some ice cream, and all this kind of craziness where it becomes turned, it's morphed into this treat, this reward. I mean, if you put a big trough of dog food out for a dog, the dog doesn't give, it doesn't really care about food. It becomes really disinterested in it and goes and does other things. If you, you know, withhold food from a dog and you start using those inflections in your voice, you want a treat, you want a treat, <laughs> the dog becomes really fixated on food and it becomes the center of its attention. It becomes obsessed and obsessive about food when um, it's sort of restricted in this way. Humans are the same way. And we need to remember that, that you can't tell a child not to eat something or, you know, they will sort of enter into that same cycle that we would classify as being fattening eating behavior, which is restricting certain things and then binging on them really hard. Or, you know, a lot of people will, because they can't eat a certain food, they'll binge on other things that are their, their safe foods. Um, but yeah, I mean, I would say that that would be one of the greatest things that you can do is just set up neutrality around it. The second thing, you know, which is along the same lines is, is creating other forms of stimulation. I mean, other things can be exciting besides television and, <laughs> and food. Um, I know it's kind of hard to conceptualize that for a lot of people in 21st century America because life sort of revol revolves around those things. And even watching most people combine the two by watching, uh, you know, Adam Richman on TV and seeing how much food he can eat <laughs> on Man vs. Food and other shows like it. So, you know, there's other things that we have to provide a very uh, inspiring environment for kids. And if we don't, the, the odds that they will become obese, overly fixated on food, uh, wasting away... Uh, in you know, drifting away into the television, all those things um, are more likely to occur when there's just really nothing else going on. So it's very important as a parent to actually do that for yourself <laughs> and then also do it for your kids. I mean, most, most parents are drifting away into the television and their lives revolve around uh, food as well because modern life doesn't always have that much excitement to it. But we can find and take advantage of modern technology to pursue passions. We can do things in the outdoors. We can force ourselves to, you know, be a little uncomfortable. I mean, obviously, it's easier to just sit around and do nothing and watch TV and eat snack food and not make any food and just be uh, kind of apathetic. And I, I can't, you know, I'm preaching... You know, I, I don't really practice what I preach because if I have TV around, a lot of times I've just become apathetic as well. Um, it's funny, like cooking and things like that, which I enjoy doing, start to feel like a real chore once I start to get into TV mode and stuff like that. So anyway, we it's really important that we sort of create a fun, exciting environment. You know, I was just thinking about this earlier. I was out on a hike and I thought about the dog thing, you know, if a dog doesn't have anything to do, it'll sit around and do nothing all day. If a kid doesn't have anything to do and you turn on a TV, they'll sit around and watch TV all day. Most kids, at least. Um, so, you know, if you really, uh, you know, if I take my, 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 I used to have a dog, if I took it out for a hike, it would, it would run and jump and run up the trail, run back the trail, jumping over logs and doing all kinds of things. And it would do that all day long. I mean, it would literally do that six, seven, eight hours, however long I was out there. So we have an amazing capacity to use our bodies physically, and we will use them if we have an exciting environment to do that. Any creature will. And, uh, you know, maybe it's uh, hard to envision that if you're living in, I don't know, rural Alabama or something like that, <laughs> um, as, as opposed to being where I'm at right now, which is... You know, at the base of a ski area where outdoor recreation is what people do. They don't really know what's going on with what's on TV. <laughs> I could ask him about 
any number of reality shows, and most people out there would have no idea what I was talking about. So, um, anyway, those are some of the things that I think are most productive. Anyway, those are some of the things that I think people should start to think about and make subtle changes. Uh, obviously, sleep is another big one. If we could just get more sleep and go to bed at an early hour, sleep in complete darkness, it, at the very least we can do that. I mean, anybody can hopefully, uh, you know, get more sleep and not be watching TV late at night or, or doing those kind of things that, that would keep you up. And I notice that I feel tired, but if a TV's on or a movie's on, I can certainly press through to keep watching it. I think a lot of people are like that. So if we were actually to get in tune with our body's physiological needs, and meet them and if we feel sleepy go to bed if we are not hungry we don't have to eat if we are hungry we do need to eat if we can get more in rhythm with that I think that would be very helpful we actually the website I believe it's intuitiveeating.com or intuitiveeating.org has actually compiled 39 39 different studies showing that the more a person eats in a way where they're not intellectualizing everything, they don't have a bunch of restrictions, and they're sort of allow themselves to be free to eat whatever they want, that they actually have lower body mass index, and um, that there's a huge connection between those two. I know that uh, Linda Bacon, another obesity researcher, she claims to have compiled 75 different studies showing that restrained or restricted eating leads to greater levels of obesity and, and whatnot. So being in tune with our body's physiological needs for movement, for food, for all those different kind of things, I, I think it's probably the place to start and just avoid doing anything extreme. Because if you do something extreme, odds are you're going to rebound and overdo it in, on the other end of that spectrum later on. I mean, it's just inevitable. I've seen it again and again and again and again. Um, so yeah, that's basically all I wanted to say about this topic. I'm sure I forgot a lot that I was going to say. And sorry about uh, having a silly fake interviewee, Matilda. But, you know, I need to keep myself entertained as well. <laughs> I'm trying to provide a stimulating environment for myself. <laughs> um, but, yeah, that's all I have to say. And I'll catch you guys for, uh, maybe I'll do another, you know, sort of not necessarily a faux interview, but maybe I'll do another uh, extended podcast format, uh, just audio recording sometime again and post it on YouTube. Let me guys let uh, let me know what you think about it, and if you'd like to see more of these, uh, you know I can definitely work those in. If you prefer just a short video, uh, that's absolutely fine too. I would imagine some people like short videos, some people like long audios, and uh, you know I'll probably end up doing a combination of the two. But anyways, I thought it would be fun to change it up a little bit and get some of those thoughts out of my head. And um, yeah, thanks for listening. Catch you again soon, Matt Stone of 180 Degree Health. Subscribe to the 180 Degree Health channel now or you will be abducted by lesbian Nazi hookers from outer space and forced into a weight loss program. It doesn't matter what you had for